Welcome to the Bible class of Jews for Jesus with Bob Mendelson. Tonight we're reading Luke chapter 24, the final in a six-month study of the Gospel of Luke, and the final for a good long time as we indefinitely shut the Bible class after tonight. We shall see when we reconstitute. In the meantime, there are lots of classes online for those who want to listen to those we've studied in the past from Genesis through Revelation. There are all kinds of lessons on the jewsforjesus.org.au website. We'll also also be increasing the One New Man activities of the One New Man community. Mm. So this coming Monday is the next community gathering, and then we're hoping that you will continue to host and welcome others into your homes and into other places where you gather. Luke 24, we saw at the end of last week that the Sabbath was a day of rest. This is not new. It's not news. It's just fascinating that in the midst of the pain of the crucifixion of the Messiah, that the women went back, verse 56 of chapter 23, returned and prepared spices and perfumes, and then they rested, according to the commandment. I love that Luke writes that in. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, well, it's, I don't know what they did, but they rested. There was something about... Uh, Shabbat, that even in the midst of the pain and the loss and the grief, they still observed what God said. I saw a sign yesterday that said mm, it was an advertisement for a either a retirement home or a funeral home. I don't remember which. That said, leave us, leave the rest to us. And I thought, that's really good. That's what heaven's about. We're going to leave the rest to him. And Sabbath is a reflection of that too. The emotions and the thought processes of the disciples on that Sabbath is unlisted in the scripture. However, when they were encountered by the risen Yeshua, they still didn't get it. So I'm going to guess no. I don't think they were reflecting on the memories of his words. I think they were feeling loss yeah. and grief more than anything else. Verse 1, on the first day of the week, early dawn, they came to the tomb. What's the first day of the week? Sunday, Yom Rishon, first day of the week. Early dawn, so it wasn't Saturday night, it was early Sunday morning. They came to the tomb, brought spices, they prepared, and they found the stone rolled away. Oh no! When they entered, they didn't even find the body, so things are disorienting straight away. The tomb should have a stone rolled in front of it. Think of a giant boulder, a circular, a cylinder, if you will, that rolled in front of the cave that Joseph had owned. Yeshua was placed inside, they sealed the tomb, remember that? We saw that before, where, if you will, like wax, like a sealing wax, some kind of super glue, whatever you want to call it, cement, some kind of preventative so that the stone wouldn't even roll, so no one could get inside or outside from inside. Now the stone's rolled away, and they don't find the body of the Lord Yeshua. This is the only time in Luke, although it's many times in the book of Acts, the phrase, the Lord Jesus. Kind of interesting. And what is, what's their response? What's the lady's response? Aporeo, disoriented, perplexed, yikes, what the heck? <laughs> you know, it's already bad enough that somebody killed our, our hero. And now I've come to do the proper things to prepare him for the burial that we didn't even have time to do on Friday. And now they've stole, what the, he's not there. They're upset, they're upset on top of upset. They're upset because he's gone. And now they're upset because they can't even fulfill at least a human kindness. And two fellows show up suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. Astrapo, this dazzle, radiant. And the women were terrified, emphobos. I mean, fear is all in them. There's nothing um, relaxed about this moment. And they bowed their faces to the ground. The men said, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Mm -hmm. Friends, if you can get this into your psyche, if you can maybe put this on the front page of your own Bible, why do you seek the living one among the dead? It may help you in figuring out where to find activities, um, emotions, relationships that are going to matter in the long haul. Dead people produce 
death. Living people produce life. And if you want the living one, you've got to hang around life and therefore living people. So many believers I know get flung out into space, flung out into death because, yeah, I went to church, I went to the congregation, I went to the Bible class, it was boring. So I decided to go to the pub because it's more exciting. Why do you seek the living one among the dead would be the words of Yeshua. I'm not saying everybody in a pub is dead. What I'm saying is look for life among living people. Look for the living one among those who are alive. Well, the angels are obviously talking about seeking the Messiah among the dead. Why? And what are they calling? The living one. Mm. Now that is shocking to these ladies, although one or two of them might have been there when Yeshua raised Lazarus, who was was dyingly dead four days and now they raised but they hadn't seen him yet and they didn't remember the words yet he's not here but he has risen maybe better he is the risen one remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee saying the son of man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men be crucified and the third day rise again don't you remember say the angels and they remembered his words ah oh, ah oh, own this because that's where life is that's where life is for you, remembering the words of Yeshua and whatever it takes. Now, what was preventing their remembrance? I mean, they watched him die. How can you remember his words? You're so sad. They're filled with the emotion of loss and loneliness and despair. They're grief struck, their capacity to remember, their capacity to think. All their juices are flowing in wrong directions. So the angel says, remember how he said he was going to, I mean, what did he call himself? The son of man, a flashback to this oft quoted text from Daniel. Remember the son of man delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise again the third day. That's, that's the gospel. That's the story. He was going to die, be buried and rise the third day. And that, that's the gospel. Paul picks that up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. They remembered his words and returned from from the tomb and reported to the eleven and to all the rest. They didn't even stick around to dust. I don't know what they did with the spices. They just, I imagine they dropped everything and <laughs> hightailed it. They ran back to the eleven who were in a known location. The location of the eleven was known. I don't know where they were, but they weren't exactly broadcasting where they were. So the small club of the inner circle, if you will, of the eleven. Why is it the eleven? And to all the rest. We don't know who those are, but my guess is this Loipoi is the remainder of the inner circle. And there were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. So those are the ladies who went to the tomb to perform the, the embalming, well, the, the spicing ritual to make the... They were the morticians, okay? They were doing the kindness. These words appeared to them as nonsense. That's, <laughs> I mean, they were so upset. The 11 were so upset because their Messiah, they'd walked with him. He'd walked with them for three years, three, maybe four years, and now gone. All their hope was hinged on him and now gone. Last night I went and heard my friend Barry Siegel speak in Seven Hills. And Barry was chronicling his engagement with a man named Derek Prince, who was one of my favorite Bible teachers ever, was the son that Derek never had. They had a beautiful relationship, Derek and Lydia first, and then Derek and Ruth. Derek was the best man at Barry and Bacha's wedding. And when he talked about Derek passing away, I sensed a similar kind of response response to what these fellows went through. And if you've got a relationship with a mentor who is so significant when he passes, you're lost for a while. That's what happened to these fellows. They thought, that's nonsense. What are you talking about Rose again? Nobody rises again. We saw him brutally murdered. Peter denied him three times, hid away. We all hid for fear. Those Roman soldiers knew how to seal that tomb. He's not out of there. What are you, Shuggy, that's what they, they thought it was. Prophets are supposed to do that, but not to themselves. Nobody raised themselves from death. Other people raised them. Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping to look in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling what had happened. We know from the other accounts that John also went. We'll see that in a moment. Verse 13, behold, you do, don't miss it. Two of them were going to Emmaus. 
a village about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that took place. And while they're talking and discussing, Yeshua himself approached and began walking with them. And their eyes, verse 13, were prevent, sorry, 16, were prevented from recognizing. He said, hey, what's going on? What are you talking about, fellas? Now it could be, I put on here Cleopas plus one. It could be Mrs. Cleopas. We don't know who it is. She's, or he is unnamed, whoever it is. Cleopas had the lead. And what are you talking about? They stood still looking sad, thinking, what are you, where are you from, buddy? Are you, verse 18, the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things that took place in these days? What are you, like from New Zealand? You know, he's he's always surprising people. Are you unaware of what happened here in these days? He said, no, tell me, what things? Verse 19, what things? And they said, Sorry, the things, what things? The things about Yeshua, the Nazarene, prophet in mighty and deed and word and sight of God and all the people. How the chief priest, look what he says, verse 20, and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. We were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel. But anyway, it's the third day. Third day since these things happened, verse 21. So Yeshua in verse 19 says, what's going on? What things? I love that. It's yeah. the irony of this. Man, don't you know what's been going on? No. Well, tell me what's happening. What's the crack? And they said, things about Yeshua. Come on. He, we thought he was the big gun. But then some of our fellas dobbed him in and they crucified him. And we were hoping, verse 21, he was going to redeem this. When we say redeem in modern modern days, it's different than the way Jews in those days thought. You go to church and you talk about, we're redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, it's all about uh, salvation and personal. And uh, we, we think redemption has to do with private, um, at least, if not personal, individual salvation. But redemption for Jewish people then, and dare I say today, has to do with national, federal redemption. We were were in Egypt. We were redeemed by the blood of lambs. God delivered us, not God delivered me. And when they say in verse 21, we thought he was going to redeem Israel, what does that mean? We won't have to suffer under their domination, under their thumb. We thought he was going to lead us into a rebellion against Rome and deliver us. Anyway, it's the third day. Now, that's a throwaway line for some, but don't miss it. The rabbis teach that a spirit of a man hovers hovers over a corpse for three days. The spirit of a man, they say, hovers over a corpse for three days. On the fourth day, it departs, which may be why, which may be why Yeshua waited two extra days in John chapter 11 to heal Lazarus. He got the note two days ago. He waited, he went, and on the fourth day, Yeshua meets Lazarus in the tomb. Why? So that no one would say, well, he was almost dead. Like Billy Crystal in Princess Bride. No, he was dyingly dead. He was gone. Fourth day, he was already gone. Yeshua raised on the third day. They say, oh, it's already the third day since these things happened. Meaning, eh, it's all, it's done. In 1994, a rabbi died in Brooklyn. That's not news. There are 500,000 Jews in Brooklyn. Every year, you got to figure one rabbi will be in the obituaries. Well, this was Menachem Schneerson the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And a lot of people had touted him to be Messiah, a claim he never knocked back. On that, when he died that summer of 94, thousands, tens of thousands of his adherents gathered from Australia, from around the globe, not only to pay him respect, but to await his imminent resurrection. They were right, Messiah would die. They were right, Messiah would rise from the dead before the fourth day. They were wrong, it wasn't a rabbi from Brooklyn. On the third day, there was great anticipation in New York, but on the fourth day, they all, save for a, a guard, departed. That's the same feeling Cleopas is saying here, eh, it's the third day. 11.59, it's really too late, it's not going to happen. And then verse 22, some women amazed us, wouldn't you know. They went down to the tomb early this morning. They didn't find his body. They came back saying they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. But we sent two of our best guys down there and they sussed it out and they couldn't find anything. Women seeing visions of angels. They don't call them old husband's tales. Yeshua interrupts them in verse 25. Oh, foolish, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter his glory? Now, those of you who grew up Jewish, 
Did you ever learn that, that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer? No, uh, this idea of Messiah suffering? No, the bad guys were gonna suffer when the Messiah came. That's what I was taught. The, the Russians, because I grew up in the 50s and 60s in, in the US, and we had two enemies, Russia and Russia. Life was simple when you were binary. Russia, because there were three million former Soviet Jews, I mean, Soviet Jews, sorry, Jewish people living in the in this now called CIS, who were not allowed to practice our religion. And also there was this Cold War that they say ended. <laughs> and as a result, uh, Russia was the bad guys and we were the good guys. So here I was, an American Jew, hoping for the Messiah to come and beat up the Russians. Not that we wanted to own the 11 time zones, or however many there are, of the former Soviet Union. No, we just wanted to get Russia off our back and we could practice our own religion. Some to move to Israel, some just to practice at the great synagogue of Moscow or Petersburg or wherever. Necessary for the Messiah to suffer and then enter? No, I'd never learned that. If I'd read the sources, I would have learned something about that, but I didn't read those. Sources like Daniel 9, sources like Micah 5, like Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. If I'd read those, even Genesis 3, if I'd read the Midrash on this, Genesis Rabbah, if I'd read that where the Messiah, that is the seed of the woman, would be born and would somehow be the serpent bruiser, if I had, um, if I'd read the source of Genesis 3, the Midrash Rabbah says that the Messiah, and it was even, even quotes Isaiah 53 in the Midrash, but I didn't read those sources. So for me, the Messiah was going to beat up Rome, oh, sorry, Russia. Here, Yeshua teaching those two, Cleopas plus one. Yeshua makes it clear that the Messiah is not only going to rule as the Son of Man, the Daniel quote, but he's also going to suffer and then enter into his glory. An avenue I never saw before uh, that Cleopas had never seen. How do we know that Yeshua explains it to them? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he had a Bible class with him. Mm. Wow. Don't you want to see that one when you go to heaven? When you go to the blockbuster DVD, uh, whatever. <laughs> On the road to Emmaus, he's explaining to them and they're explaining to him. They're explaining to him, don't you know what's going on? And he says, <laughs> fellas, let me explain some things to you. I like that. Verse 28, as they approached the village where they were going, which was Emmaus, Yeshua acted as though he were going on further. And they urged him, said, no, come on, we're Australians. Stick around, we're going to have tea. Anyway, it's almost over. The day's almost over. Where are you going to go? There's no motels, there's no holiday inn down the road. We don't know, just an ordinary Greco-Jew who was a believer or at least an anticipator of God doing something through Yeshua. That's all we know. So he goes in and stays with them. Verse 30, when they'd reclined, at the table. <laughs> Sounds like Passover. It just is the way you ate. That's all. He took the bread and blessed it and broke it. Huh. Whose house is this? And yet Yeshua is performing the bracha. Maybe because, maybe because they said, you're the guest, you know, please say the bracha. Okay. So he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then, verse 31, their eyes were open. Verse 16, their eyes were prevented. Verse 31, their eyes were open. So while Yeshua is explaining messy prophecy on the road to Emmaus, they still didn't get it. Their eyes were not opened until verse 31 in the village. Then they got it. That is so helpful to me because sometimes you explain the gospel to people, you make it clear, you think you can, they're right there and they just don't get it. Friends, that's just blindness. That's all. And then one moment while you're still explaining it, they get it. And you think, oh yeah, I'm pretty good. No, it's not related to you at all. It's a Holy Spirit thing. God opens the eyes of people. And when we ask people to pray for us while we're out on a mission or out on the streets or visiting with Jewish people in the shop or in their homes, we really mean it. I want you to pray for Menachem and Larry and Jose and all the Jewish people in your sphere of influence. Because why do we pray? Why do we have to pray? They're smart Jewish. Jewish people are smart. They 
can get it. No, they can't get it. It's not a natural function. It's a spiritual function. We pray that God opens their eyes. In Isaiah 44, in Psalm 69, the stupor, this mud, this smear that's on our Jewish eyes is only lifted when Yeshua opens our eyes. It's not something that's naturally caused, and therefore it can't be naturally conquered. It's Holy Spirit stuff. Their eyes were open, verse 31, and they recognized him, and then he vanishes. Now that's got to be spooky. <laughs> You're laughing, and it's, it's, it's so weird. Mind you, they've just had a Bible class with the Savior, right? They, they're they so disoriented. They were rearranging the pebbles on the road as they're walking back to Jerusalem. He said, what, what's going on? You look so downcast. They were looking sad, it said. Yeah, well, like Eeyore. Oh, well, our Messiah, we thought he was, but he didn't come. And then he says, so let's have a little Bible study. And he explains to them, he didn't open his pocket Older Testament. I mean, he just explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they still didn't get it. He breaks the bread. What do you imagine they saw when he broke the bread? What did they see? His body was not broken. His body was pierced with nails. When he broke the bread, they saw the nail prints in his wrist. Whoa, whoa, you're, oh. And they believed, that's right. No, his body wasn't broken. Uh, not one bone of his body was broken. That's important to fulfill biblical prophecy and why it's significant that he gave up the ghost on the cross rather than wait for the Roman soldier to break his leg so he couldn't prevent asphyxiation that way. It's a very important medical thing. They, he vanished from their sight. That is spooky. Here they are watching. Here they are going from ultra sadness to the encounter with the risen Yeshua, the story that the ladies told us this morning. Whoa, it's Tr it's true, gone. What? Whoa, where are you? <laughs> You're, oh, yeah, he was right here. And then they said, verse 32, I don't know if this is irony. We're not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. I, I somehow hear this as irony, like, yeah, sure, you knew what was going on. Your eyes were closed. I'm not sure they got it. But maybe they're re- thinking what happened on the road to Emmaus when he was explaining it. And they got up that very hour. Now it was already nighttime because they're already having evening meal, right? And they said, come on, it's getting late. So they, they implored Yeshua to stay. Now after the revelation of the Son of Man, boom, they hop up and they hightail it, those miles back to Jerusalem, the 11K. This is Heartbreak Hill. I mean, they're going. And they found gathered together the 11 and those who were with them. So so Peter made it back in with the group. But wherever they were, this was a known group. So Cleopas was probably one of that inner circle, but we don't know who he is. And they said, the Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. I mean, they knew the Easter vigil. Uh, and he's appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Wow. They're interrupting each other. I can just see the two saying, no, 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 no. And then he told us this. Remember that Bible verse he used? Yeah, I know never heard Micah 5 before. And then this one, and, and then we went inside and he broke the bread. Remember? And he the nails and the bread and the hallelujah and they'd gone. And, and so they're trying to sort it out. And if you've ever had a religious experience like they have, you want to unpack this with some of your friends. This isn't, yes, I know all things. Let me explain it to you. I think they're explaining it to say, what the heck just happened? Because they're disoriented. Wouldn't you be? You're, you're walking with this guy who's from New Zealand, and he doesn't know what's going on. You explain it, then he explains the Bible, then he un reveals himself, and then he vanishes. You, Whoa, this is not a normal day, dear diary. Just another day. This was not one of those. <laughs> Verse 36, you think it could get wilder? <laughs> While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said, Shalom Aleichem. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> This is, this is not normal. We saw you dead, then you were alive, then you're here, then you're gone. Are we having a, a hallucination? Are we having some kind of community? Epiphany. Epiphany, that's so 
so holy. I don't know what we're having, but we're all seeing this same apparition. This is a hologram before the word had been invented. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a pneuma, a, a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? <laughs> Sir, can I explain why I'm troubled? <laughs> Do you really not get it? Why am I troubled? You were dead, you're alive, you are hopeful, then you're gone, and then you're risen, but you're not, and the stone, and emotions are all over the place. Why do doubts arise in your heart? Not yet. They didn't believe yet. They're disoriented. There's no faith going on here. There's some semblance of faith, but it's not faith yet. So he says, see me, feel me. This is like, like a pinball wizard. Um, see my hands and my feet. Have you, have you ever been dizzy? You ever get off an airplane or off of a, a merry-go-round or anything? Or you've just gotten up too quickly at home after a after a late night, you get a little, yeah, after surgery, sure. So when you're disoriented or dizzy, you know what they say to do in order to get yourself back to square so you're not dizzy anymore? Focus on one thing, uh, the X on the exit sign or right here. If you're a little dizzy, just look at the letter G. You know, you stand up too quickly at the end of Bible class tonight. Oh, oh, just zoom in put your eyes on the G your eyes on on the middle of that picture something and what happens is your body and your mind is orient or focus stabilize in that way so here is a group of disoriented 11 to 30 people huddled for fear of what might come to them and he then Yeshua says what's upsetting you and he answers their disorientation with a way to orient what is it see my hands my feet it is I, myself, touch me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Six times he uses the word I or me or my. Because if you want orientation in life, it's focusing not on the letter G, but on the person of Yeshua. Fixing your eyes on him stabilizes your whole life. And you might have everything under control, so you think. But if your eyes are not fixed on Yeshua, you are out of control. You are disoriented to life. You want orientation in life, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He says at the end of 39, flesh and bones don't have, I'm sorry, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. What is, what do we usually say about a body? Flesh and blood. blood. Flesh and blood. But he's no longer flesh and blood. Why not? His blood has been drained, poured out on the earth. Isaiah 63. I poured out my life blood on the earth. Um, 63, not 53. Yeah, so he's now flesh and bones, not flesh and blood. You'll see that in a Corinthian later too. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet while they still couldn't believe it because of their joy and amazement he said got any leftovers and they gave him a piece of broiled fish he took and ate it before them it's fascinating to me that the apostle who wrote this dr luke would put in physical evidence for the resurrection mind you it takes two things to clarify that the resurrection has taken place what are the two things here's one of them a physical body with whom you know you can touch you can eat with, you can talk to, physical body. What's the other reality that has to be there? Because you could all say it's an apparition. The, the physical body was one. Yeah. What's the other one? It's the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. See, if the tomb is empty, but there's no physical appearance, then somebody could steal the body and hide it somewhere or burn it or, you know, whatever. If the bodies are, the body is there, but no empty tomb, then this could be an apparition, a vision. But with both the empty tomb and the physical body of Yeshua, eating, talking, you have all the proof you need that that really did happen. And now you can believe it. He said to them in verse 44 and following, he explains the Bible. By the way, I said uh, right at the top here, the tomb, he's not here. On Emmaus, he is here. In verse 36 and following, he is really here. Okay, And now he's going to explain it one more time. Verse 44, he said to them, these are my words. I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything had to be fulfilled in Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. In other words, the whole Bible, the whole of what we had then, which was Tanakh. I, I know your version says, 
says Psalms, and you say, well, that's just the Psalms. That's not the writings. But it was the first book of the writings in the list. When I say Genesis, I mean Genesis through Deuteronomy or Torah. You understand? Mm -hmm. So in the same way, prophets begins with Isaiah, but it includes all these others. If I just said Isaiah, I could mean only Isaiah or I could mean all the prophets. Mm -hmm. And then Psalms, the first book of the writings, could just mean Psalm. But by implication here, it's pretty clear. The law of Moses and prophets and Psalms means the entirety of the Old Testament. Torah Nevim, Ketuvim, the Tanakh, it's all, po it's an arrow that points to Yeshua. That is the explanation. There's a lot of explaining going on, which is good. Then he opened, verse 45, their minds to understand the scripture. <laughs> In verse 31, he opened the eyes of two people, Cleopas plus one. Now he opens the minds of the 11, the 12, the 50, however many there were there. And it takes God to open minds. Amen? I mean, that's what it is. It's not human reason. He said to them, this is what's written. The Messiah would suffer, rise again from the dead the third day, and, I love that, repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed or preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, and you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So Luke ends with the words of Yeshua there, which then leads into the book of Acts, where it picks up with that very thing. So it's part A, then part B. That makes sense to me. Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. It's written. Where is it written that the Messiah would suffer? We already chronicled Isaiah some of those. 53. Yeah, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 63, Daniel 9, Micah 5, Psalm 22. Mm -hmm. Psalm 22. So there, there are lots of references, mm -hmm. okay? Where is it written that he would rise from the dead the third day? Hosea chapter 6. You yeah. scored. You, you got that one right. Hosea 6. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is certain as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth on the second day. On the third day, he will raise us. I mean, this is so powerful because it's not just he will raise him up, but he will raise us up, which means those who believe in Yeshua will be raised up as well. The resurrection of Yeshua lifted him and dear friends, it lifts us up. That's the promise. That's the earnest. Amen. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. So if you believe in the death of Yeshua in verse 46, and you believe in the resurrection of Yeshua on the third day, verse 46, then because of that and, you have to believe in the proclamation of the name of Yeshua in verse number 47. So it's all there in all the scripture. Go and tell, go and tell. That's for all people, all of us. It's not just for the 12 or the 11 to go into Thomas, you're supposed to go to India and preach to the Indians. Good on you, matey. And Peter, you're supposed to go to the Jews. And Paul, you're supposed to, oh wait, there is no Paul. Um, but different ones are supposed to go to different categories of people. But he's saying to us in Sydney, Australia in 2019, go and tell. And wait, you get the power from on high from the Holy, the Holy One. Stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Endued, endued, <laughs> endowed. Verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany. Who was there? Who was from Bethany? Uh, uh, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. Mm -hmm. So down the neighborhood. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. That looks so, who did that? Who who lifted up his hands in the Bible? Moses lifts up his hands. So, so the new Moses, the new lawgiver, is raising his hands and he's going to bless the people. While he's blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. That would spook me out some fears. I would say, next, <laughs> beam me up, Scotty. I mean, where where do you stand? Where do, where's the transporter? I want to get right there. And then after worshiping him, worshiping Jesus, returned to Jerusalem. So they came back down, if you will, they went up the hill from Bethany up to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. They gathered, they prayed, they rejoiced. These are the activities of the people of God. Now that Yeshua is risen, we need to go and tell and gather and pray and rejoice. That's what we do. Um, sometimes we're a little more gathering, sometimes we're 
we're a little more telling, sometimes we're a little more rejoicing, whatever. The book of Luke begins with angels making announcements. What was the announcement by the angels at the beginning of the book of Luke? The births of the cousins, right, John the Baptist, and, and the angels, and glory to God in the highest, and the shepherds, and angels made announcements at the beginning, and angels made the announcement that he's risen. I like that. Luke is really a Holy Spirit guy. He is the most Holy Spirit guy of the four biographers of the person of Yeshua. No. The power of God, he just, look, you can't read John or Matthew or Mark and not see Holy Spirit's activity, of course. But ba, I mean, hands down, Luke records Luke, way most. more. And I, I think that's significant because Luke was a medical doctor, which makes him a scientist in his day, a naturalist in his day. And when a naturalist encounters the living God, he has to go supernatural. He has to go above his own thinking. And one of the things that, look, I was a mathematics teacher. I have a right brain problem. <laughs> That's what we call it. Um, I think rationally. I live That's rationally different. because I've got a, a, a problem in my right brain. It's got a wash, testosterone wash. And that's just the way we function. Not all men are like that, but I'm representing the men who do. Uh, it is, it's real to me when I encountered the living Jesus in May of 1971. My life changed, radically changed. I am not the same guy as I was. I still think God didn't make me check my brain at the cross, but there's something bigger than my head, bigger than my mental capacity. I would never have gotten saved, nor would Cleopas have gotten saved if it were merely an academic exercise. There's the power of God doing what God does in drawing people like you and me to himself. We've studied the book of Luke. We've studied lots of books in the Bible. This is the end of this Bible class, and it's the end of the Bible class as we know it today. We are indefinitely canceling Bible study here, and I am already going through a level of grief. I'm not disappointed, I'm just grieving, because God's leading us to do this. So if God leads, you go with what God does, even if it's against your own ideas. Before creation, before the world began, from earth's foundation, Yeshua the Lamb.